My name is Marko Kangasporo, and I'm director of the Alexandria Institute. I have a, have a honor to open this farewell lecture of my colleague and predecessor, Professor Marko Kivinen. He led the institute over 20 years from the day it was established in 1996 to last year's spring. Professor Kivinen has had a high profile acting as expert for decision makers and his role in public discussion, societal discussion has been significant. Today we are focusing Professor Kivinen's academic legacy. Professor Kivinen's farewell lecture, Legacies and Choices, is their road to freedom. Ties together the major findings for his uh, 40 years career. However, before Kivinen's lecture, we hear Chancellor Hammer's words, you are welcome. After him, we have Vice Rector Berling and Dean of the Faculty of Arts, Pirjo Hidenmaa. Distinguished Professor Kivinen, dear Marku, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure to welcome you to this for, uh, farewell um, lecture. First of all, I'd like to thank you very warmly on behalf of myself and the university of all the work you have contributed both as a professor and as a uh, director of the Alexandri Institute. Thank you very much. And um, as we know, your role in, uh, um, in the Institute has been naturally cent central since you've been essentially director of the, the Institute since the very establishment of the Institute. Um, in addition uh, to being a director, you have uh, been systematically working also on the on the very core tasks of, of a professor, which is, uh, in my opinion, very impressive. Um, looking from a little bit far, just uh, based on the on the records that can be found uh, in the internet, uh, you have been able to have a great number of publications, students, projects, uh, lectures, seminars, everything that a professor is supposed to be doing. And it's, it's very impressive to, to consider this as, as uh, we all know what it is to, to run a, a big institute and, and uh, being there to, to really open it from, from the very, very um, scratch. To, to, to say so, and uh, not, not to forget that you've been also during the recent years uh, uh, director of uh, one of the Center of Excellences of the Finnish Academy of Science. Uh, the professors have not one, not two, but three tasks, as stated in the in the university law, and naturally your achievements in the Tasks one and two, the research and education, are significant. But for an outsider, I think the, the, the task three, the, the interaction with the society, is something which really shows off. And it can be seen as, as um, interviews, um, public, public uh, uh, texts and opinions, which, are, uh, which can be still found in the internet. And uh, we know the, the field of the Alexandri Institute is, is, is very interesting. The Russian Eastern Europe studies is something where uh, in society and in culture, a lot of things has happened. 
In, in the recent years, I, my, my memory goes back to something like late 70s. And uh, since then, so much has happened and, and somebody has been there to, to analyze and to see all of this in, in, uh, in professional way. Uh, on a personal note, I, I studied uh, Russian language in, in, uh, in the school, in the elementary school and, and high school back in the 70s, eight, early 80s, which was not a very popular thing to do those days. But it was uh, great to see the, the, the Russian culture from a little bit uh, different perspective as, as what the Finns usually see. And I, I think being an expert in this field and a director of such an institute gives you a, a really a unique position to, to see what is going on in this region. And this can be seen as, as um, uh, so many different uh, types of uh, comments and, and opinions you have been uh, asked to give for, for the public. And, and I think it's, it's something which, as, as we know, the, the neighbor of, of us is one of, the, uh, one of the largest countries of the world, one of the military superpowers, etc. So it's, it's not always so easy to, to really uh, create a balanced opinion and, and uh, to be able to formulate it clearly and, and neutrally in, in the political um, environment we are uh, within all the time. So I, I think this is um, uh, great achievements that you have been contributed for, for the uh, University of Helsinki and also for the Finnish society as a whole. And I think we are all very thankful that uh, we are hosting such an institute at the moment and, and our profile in understanding what is happening in the in the Russia and in the eastern part of the Europe is 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 very strong right here in, in our university. And very much thanks is is to, to, to you and, and the director work you have been central in, in doing. So once again I, I thank you and I warmly welcome you all to 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 listen to this um, farewell lecture and uh, I also wish you all the best for the coming years. Thank you. Herr Kanzleri, Dekani, hyvät ystävät, dear friends, but most of all, dear Marku, it's really an honor and pleasure for me to be here on, on uh, this day celebrating your, I should say, outstanding career at, at the university. Uh, we will hear many times the word Alexander Instituti, and I think it's very, very, it was a genius thing to, to, to start the institute here at the, the university, the former Alexander University. Uh, it was, I have been told, not an easy task, in fact. People were opposing, do we need such an institute and should it be in Helsinki? Fortunately, it was established and I think that the news we hear every day tells that the, the institute really has a place still. I think it was today I read that China and, and Russia decided that they are the best friends in the world, and, and, and I think we have to study the Russian society closely. And, and I think our tradition, our, our, our history makes it natural that we are the ones who can do it. Well, we are not the only one who have noticed it. Internationally, Alexander Institute is, is very famous. We have a program for international fellows. I, I, I know that we have had over 130 fellows here from 30 countries. So, so you have really fulfilled our uh, strategic goal of being a an, an, an global, uh, global impact. Uh, uh, the Chancellor mentioned the, the, the Academy project, uh, which also has been very successful and, and, and very 
very uh, act, uh, on, 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 the, on the edge in the, in the time. And I was told that, that uh, the news about the uh, academy project came on your birthday. Is that true? So you had double reason to celebrate your 60 years. Now we celebrate your retirement from the official post, but I suppose that means only that we are not going to pay you any salary anymore, but you are going to continue doing research. I, I, I really do hope that, 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 that you will, will, will continue that. Uh, on behalf of the leadership, I want to give you a small gift so, so we can meet in the middle somewhere here. Thank you. <laughs> Arvoisa kansleri, hyvä vararehtori, hyvä Markku, professori Kivinen, ladies and gentlemen, almost uh, 25 years ago, uh, and uh, 25 years, you know, it's an academic scale to measure results, so not quarter of a year, but quarter of a century. So, uh, 1996, almost 25 years ago, in that political and social context, the need of research and deep understanding of Russian culture and society was well recognized. Finland was a new member at European Union, and it was the only EU country that had a border, joint border with Russia, and that border was uh, between EU and Russia as well. Uh, the new institute was founded and it needed a director. Marku Kivinen was a professor of sociology at the University of Rovaniemi at that time. He saw the challenge of the new institute and was appointed the first director of the institute. His expertise came from sociology, not from political sciences or economy, but, uh, or Russian studies, not either, but Professor Kivinen's basic principle has always been a sociologist is always interested in everything. And we have seen this uh, sociologist is, is interested always in everything. Marku Kivinen was open-minded and visionary enough to see the remarkable future of the new institute already in the beginning. While the Ministry of Education um, had in mind had a plan of modest information and coordination centre uh, regarding the information and understanding of Russia, Kivinen started to build an ambitious centre of Russian knowledge, kind of independent school, which includes both research and education, and above this is active in societal interaction organizing public seminars, giving lectures and advice. This vision has come true. Today, Alexandri Institute is one of the crown jewels at the University of Helsinki and in the Faculty of Arts. The Institute has had a huge contribution to high quality research. Just to mention the Center of Excellence funded by Academy of Finland and led by uh, Professor Kivinen 2012-2017. Uh, and uh, um, this year the university has had a research assessment by external uh, experts and assessors. The outcome of Alexandri Institute's research was excellent. The Institute's uh, status and role, both on national and international level, is well recognized due to Marko Kivinen's work. National Alexandri Forum needs one of the biggest halls at the university. For instance, this year, the organizers expected to get about 78 guests to the forum, but they needed a bigger hall because participants were 180. So, Alexandri Institute's work is well known. On international level, Alexandri Conference gathers hundreds of guests and speakers from various countries. 
One of Kivinen's fruitful innovations is the visitors program at the Institute. Short-term visitors come every year to the Institute in order to network and create contacts and collaboration with the researchers of the University of Helsinki. This innovation earns to be copied by other units and the university as well. As a linguist, I would like to crystallize ideas with one core word, and I have been thinking, what is the word that's good for Professor Kivinen? Uh, I chose uh, the prefix multi, and in order to use this word, I've created some neologisms. Marko Kivinen has promoted multidisciplinary work. He has combined successfully researchers in social sciences, history, uh, humanities, culture, economy, philosophy, literature. And this has led to valuable expertise, which has accumulated and benefited both re the research community and the society. Marko Kivinen has worked, uh, has, uh, is multi-institutional in his work. Uh, so he has networks and contacts with enterprises, governments, ministries, media, politicians, uh, and other stakeholders. And he can sit at any table and discuss and find relevant topics just in that table. Kivinen has been multi-actional. He has been a high-quality researcher, an inspiring research director and leader of scholars, an ambitious teacher and supervisor, an eloquent speaker, an active debater in science and university policy. He has been interviewed 100 times on TV, radio and other media. He doesn't repeat himself, but finds new and sometimes something surprising to say. As a director, he has given hope and pushed his team to success, even at the moments of difficulties and unpleasant criti criticism towards the Institute. During his time, the Institute has got the best research community award by University of Helsinki. Finally, Marko Kivinen is a multi-skilled uh, scholar. As an academic, he has a long list of publications. It's uh, three pages long, only the academic peer-reviewed publications and then other publications above that. More than 100 scientific publications, almost 20 monographs, tens of professional articles and book chapters, and a long list uh, of articles and books to the larger audience. And finally, he's an author of two novels, and as far as I know, he's going to continue his career in belles lettres and in fiction. So we have something to wait, maybe next book market, uh, book launch in the autumn. I've heard uh, that Marko Kivinen is a football player too, and uh, a good football, football player. Maybe I'm not a right person to comment football, but I want to say, uh, maybe this is a good symbol of your work and your contribution to the academic community. In football, you do huge teamwork. You need lots of energy and enthusiasm. You need to have a common goal and you need to share the success. So, on behalf of the University and Faculty of Arts, I thank Marko Kivinen for this valuable, multidimensional, multidisciplinary, multitasking, multi-actional, multi-skilled career at the University, and wish you all the best success for your future activities. And on behalf of the University, I would like to give you the multicolored tie to remember <laughs> multicolored flowers. Please, Marko. And I have a honor to invite distinguished Professor Kivinen to give a farewell lecture, Legacies and Choices, Is There a Road to Freedom? Please, Professor Kivinen, floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Thank you for, uh, for this very nice uh, 
words. Of course, all these achievements are made in the, together with other people, and it's not only on my behalf that you should thank for, for the establishment and the development of the Alexander Institute. It, is, it has always been a, a common effort and joint effort by, by our people, and many of the ideas are not my making. There are other people who have been making them as well. So uh, this um, this is uh, this is what the university is all about. It's about the people who work together in a good spirit, and this is um, how it should be. But now I'm turning to to the substance, to the to the final uh, lecture in uh, about Russia, about our major topics. Of course, we cover other, other regions as well, and, and we have covered other regions and will cover. But, but I will speak about Russia and um, about our center of excellence and our major results, how we see Russia today on the basis of our results. After having eight years of work, um, this is, uh, this is what my lecture is all about, and this is a challenging topic. We are not, we don't know everything, we don't, we, this is also, when we talk about our knowledge of Russia, it's always talking about the limits of our knowledge as well. It's not only what we know, but we always have to also understand what we do not know. And this is also a point which I am going to point out, that in order to figure out, uh, this will be a hardcore kind of a, a so sociology talk today, but, the, uh, but anyway, the, the issue is that even if we have received, reached uh, significant results in conceptual terms, these concepts are only the beginning of, of research of Russia. They only give methodological instruments for further understanding of Russia. But I hope that they are something that cannot be neglected in the future years in discussing on this topic. So I, I will start by uh, by showing a couple of books which have been published quite recently about Russia. There is first this Svetlana Alexeyevich, frame a second hand. We all know who Svetlana Alexeyevich is. Svetlana Alexeyevich is a Nobel Prize winner in literature. Even if she is not, she is not a, a fiction author. She has uh, made this book on the basis of interviews of ordinary people in contemporary Russia. This is the reason why many Russian authors whom I haven't been able to meet during the years also are kind of problematizing the fact that how come Svetlana Alexeyevich can get the Nobel Prize in literature. But unfortunately, and this is, I think this is the case at the moment, that the literature is not very effective in, uh, the, the reality is so dramatic that the books about Chernobyl about the transition. Frame in second hand is about Russian uh, legacy or the Soviet transition. They are so dramatic that no fiction can overcome that level. And that's, that's also something which is very, very significant and, and worth understanding. That this, of course, this is something that the social scientists should do. We should face these people and, and hear their voice and understand the the, uh, the issues which are connected to contemporary Russia, because this picture which this book is giving is, is highly contradictory in many ways. You can hear many tra tragic discussions, but, but it's also surprising in those terms that you can hear their voices, for example, people who, who have been dissidents but are still hankering for the Soviet years because for example, they say that now money is everything. We used to talk about poetry, 
who used to talk about literature. This is all lost. Now money is everything. These kind of points are the, bring us something which is significant in terms of contemporary Russia. That the, it's not evident. It's, uh, it's not something which, which is easy to explain. Then the other book, very popular book as well, Masa Gessen's book, about the, the future is history. And the subtitle is How Totalitarianism Reclaimed Russia. Pulitzer Prize winner about Russia. Very popular in the United States at the moment. Making the argument that totalitarianism is the truth of contemporary Russia. I don't think that any Russian specialist in this room would re regard that as a relevant point, in fact. But this is the direction that, that the discussion in the West is taking at the moment. And this is also a challenge for us, again, who try to have some kind of a more sophisticated understanding of contemporary Russia. Russia is authoritarian, but it's not totalitarian. In many ways, Russia is far from being totalitarian. In many ways, it is extreme pluralistic, plural, more pluralistic than many of the other societies, more, probably more pluralistic in ideological terms than, than Finland. Much, much more absurd positions are accepted in Russian discussion than in Finnish discussion, for example, in many ways. So totalitarianism is not the answer. It doesn't give us understanding of contemporary Russia. So, this is also a fascinating book where my, my title, the title comes in fact from, this is a, this is a book, a Polish scholar writing about, about post-Soviet transition. It's about the bears and about the people at the same time. Funny book, very nice book. I'll show you one, one small clip. Okay, this is, the book is about true stories about people and bears. You know, in Eastern Europe, there used to be a lot of bear raising people who were, uh, who were also entertaining peop uh, people by, by raising up bears and, and living with bears. Uh, the thing is that the bears, when they were captured, they had to, they had to dance, they had to, this, now it's coming. They had to uh, do many kinds of things, for example, dance, do all kinds of circus kind of tricks, whatever. And they had, okay, here we go. This uh, YouTube video has the name uh, Russian Bear Dancing. So we have a Russian bear, a very small Russian bear in this case, dancing over there. and. It has a chain in its nose where the people can direct its moves and so forth all over and, and control it. The people who are living with bears, they can control the bears and so forth. And the whole idea is to entertain people. Now, how is this related to freedom? It's related to freedom in that way that we... Um, when the European Union came to Eastern Europe, this kind of bear dancing and, and living with bears was prohibited. And the bears were moved to a special place, Belitsa, where they were staying uh, free. They were giving baths and a very nice kind of atmosphere where they, they were supposed to live. Nice kind of a bear life, in a wild life, in a free life. And it turned out that they, they were not able to live that kind of life anymore. 
because first of all, they had lost their teeth in fin the people had taken the teeth out of them because they they did not want them to bite. They uh, they had uh, um, they have learned to to dance. For example, when they heard music or saw people, they, they have learned these kinds of things. And every uh, and some of them started to dance when when they saw a human being. And the, the argument that this uh, Polish guy is making is that the, this is the same thing with people who are living under tyranny. So that people who are hankering for the Soviet system, they are, they are, they have been distracted in the same way than than these bears, that they are not able to live. And this idea of the legacy is very strong in the West as well. The whole idea that the uh, Everything dates back to the Soviet years, that the Soviet years have destroyed these people, that these people are not able to work in an ordinary kind of um, free life, in a free market economy, in a democratic society, and so forth. I don't think that this explanation is true either. It's a nice kind of way to put the argument, nice kind of a book, but still I don't think that the social scientist can believe in this kind of explanation. I don't think that the Russians or the Eastern Europeans are, are different from us. I don't think that as people they are less incompetent in living with freedom than we are. We have to look at other things in the society. We have to look at the institutions. We have to look at the living conditions where they live. We have to look at the constraints and resources that they have for their living and also the agencies that are making their histories. And this is where my hardcore sociological analysis starts. This is also entertainment. This beginning was my bear dance for you. Now I'm, I'm really going to the substance. Why we need a new paradigm in Russian studies? It's exactly for these reasons. On the other hand, we have very simplified understandings based on totalitarianism, very simplified ex explanations concerning legacies. <laughs> and however, what we intend to do in, in our effort is to give a new explanation which will be so, has a solid social science basis. The first point here is, is very complicated. It is, it is a thing which is really annoying me at the moment very much. And I, I feel that this point about the social sciences and the legacies of social sciences in the post-Cold War world is something, there is some kind of a legacy which I would not like to leave for the next generation, but which we are leaving. And this is the intellectual incapacity of the West to work in the post-Cold War world. The, the way how the West has been taking the position that everything which we did during the Cold War was right, that we were the winners of the Cold War. I think this is intellectually false, this is wrong, and this is misleading, and this means that there is a huge intellectual challenge for us again, because there is a new Cold War almost at the moment going on in the world. This is, this, I, I, this is not the point where the Alexander Institute started. This is not, there was the possibility to have some kind of a joint Vergangenheitsbewältigung about the crimes that were made by both sides and the limitations on the both sides. But it was not realized. And what we are facing now is some kind of a suggested civilizational conflict between the East and the West again. And this is very sad. And I, I don't think that this legacy is something which, is, which we should have left for the next generation. But anyway, there is, for the social sciences and the theories of social science, it is also significant to understand that the social science was very much reflected in, the, in, uh, in terms of the Cold War that the alternatives, for example, was presented as mutually exclusive. 
if you were a Marxist, you could not accept the Weberian points and so forth. And this, this was how the discussion was many times constructed. And this is not how it should happen in the social sciences. It's much more complicated. You, if you look at these positions in real social science terms, you can immediately acknowledge that many people and all, almost all scholars agree upon many things. We have to see what people are agreeing upon and where the differences really are. And this is what we are hankering for in, in our new paradigm also, that not too simplified explanations of contemporary Russia, not too simplified, not simplified assumptions which would run already the results. And for that we need new kinds of theories because big social science theories do not explain much, in fact. Most of the contemporary social science and modernization, when we spoke about Russian modernization, we faced two kinds of criticism usually. The other was that, that the, we, are, we are following the, the suite of the Russian government, because Russian government was at the moment also speaking about modernization. And the Russians were afraid of talking about modernization at all. And at the same time, the Western scholars were saying that this is old-fashioned social sciences, because the, the, uh, the modernization theory is gone. It's, it doesn't exist anymore. And of course, we did not accept neither of the arguments, nor the argument that, the, uh, that we would define the modernization or conceptualize the modernizations only in terms of the, the, as the Russian government theorizes it or understands it, if they theorize it at all. But the other, other thing was also that the, we did not accept the linear modernization theory which was suggested by the Western scholars because it doesn't exp explain almost anything that is happening in contemporary Russia. We had to have some kind of a theory which was open for empirical reality, this contradictory demanding reality which existed in Russia. And for that matter, we uh, conceptualized this on the basis of Anthony Giddens' uh, structuration theory. For those who are not familiar with social theory, this theory, in fact, is very simple. It, it states only that, on the other hand, in the society there are structures, and structures can be constraining or enabling. If they are enabling, they, they mean resources for the people. And then there are agencies who act on the basis of these structures, on the basis of constraints and resources that they have. And this was what we were intending to study in contemporary Russia, because this was abstract enough. Everybody could agree upon it in our center of excellence. About, uh, we had about 50 scholars in that, and those who understood the theoretical starting points could work with these concepts, and they could conceptualize their own topic starting from these concepts. And this was the beginning. But this was not the end. This was not the explanations that we were going to give in the end. We have to show the limits of the previous paradigms in Russian studies. This is not systematically done in, in any of our publications because we were not really saying that all the previous paradigms are misleading. But we tried to figure out to what extent they explain. What are the limits to how they explain and, and why they, are, they have the limits that they have? Okay, then we defined uh, the Russian big challenges as much as we could figure them out in the beginning. The first challenge was that Russia was still dependent on hydrocarbons and it had to diversify its economy. The second was the, some kind of a choice of the political system, the development of the legal system. These are very big issues, in fact, all. Then the welfare regime, the, the huge social crisis that existed in, in Russia in the 1990s. In fact, I have a favorite favorite slide, which I would like to show you in empirical research. This is my favorite. 
I can't avoid it in almost any of my presentations because I think it shows. Sorry. <laughs> in almost all of the countries in the world, when the GDP grows, the life expectancy grows. But this did not happen in Russia. In 1990s, there was a huge decline in the life expectancy of people. In fact, millions of people in Russia were dying in advance. In, in, they, have, they were lacking three years after Finland, and suddenly they were 20 years back. And this happened even in the conditions where the economy was growing. So Russia is, for us and men, they are still behind, for example, countries like India, which have the GDP one-tenth of Russia. This kind of a social crisis definitely needed some kind of explanation, understanding, and analysis, and also policy measures. So the social policy, this, this was the welfare aspect. Then, of course, as the fourth point which we had to study was the foreign policy, how Russia situates itself within the, within the contemporary world. In this respect, the problem always is, that often is that Russia is understood or analyzed as if Russia were some kind of a lonely rider in the world system. It's not a lonely rider, it's not the only action element in, in the world system, but Russia is also in international system, there are rules and resources, and the rules are both formal and informal. There are formal rules concerning the international agreements, international law, and so forth, and then there are informal rules based on the resources that the countries have, and they have to be, if the military has to be, for example, nuclear, nuclear force, it means that it has to be recognized by the others in informal terms in crises like in Georgia and Ukraine. Russia is not only in the only country in the world, it's not an omnipotent actor, but definitely it must be understood in the context of the international system. And also Russian choices have to be understood in the context of the international system. What we intended to do is to analyze Russia in those terms which I highlighted. And then in, uh, what we did was that we stepped back from the uh, usual approaches concerning Russia. We stepped one step back to bigger social theory problems. And then we uh, neglected the linear modernization theory. The problem in that theory is, is usually that the, it suggests that some kind of differentiation process is happening in the modern world, that the institutions in modern society tend to be more and more independent of each other. And this was, of course, not the case at all in Russia, but there was much more interdependencies. There was not this kind of uh, legitimate indifference, but there was illegitimate indifference between the spheres. And our, what our approach brings in is it brings contradictions and conflicts, however, without Marxist biases, bias on social class and without master process of differentiation. This is hardcore social theory argument that we are making in this thing. And then we wanted to bring in agency and choice and finally, make an interdisciplinary synthesis on the basis of our understanding of Russian, Russian challenges. The big fifth challenge is, is the foreign, not 
is the, the culture. And in culture, it's always, at the moment, the cultural explanations of Russia tend to be such that the, the strong tendency to essentialize Russia, as if Russia was always the same, and if there were only one thing in Russia. And totalizing explanations are, are very dominant in previous approaches and contemporary approaches of Russia as well. What is very significant for us, and this is one of my legacies for, for the social sciences in general in terms of the younger generation, is that don't believe in linear processes, don't believe in, in straightforward trends, ask always about counter trends, ask about contradictions, ask what are the counter forces, ask about counter evidence concerning your own arguments and so forth. This is extremely significant in contemporary Russia because we don't understand Russia without taking into account how contradictory it in fact is and what kind of choices they are making. We can only understand if we take into account that this is a contradictory reality. Now, um, not to make this too long, I'm jumping to the results. We started with five challenges and we end up with ten antinomies. And with the antinomies we made things which Russian, no Russian uh, decision-making processes can avoid. In a way they define, they define the basic tensions that exist in contemporary Russia as it now stands. And these antinomies, they are not this is again a kind of a hard philosophical argument. They are not Hegelian contradictions. And there is no dominant contradiction. But they are antinomies in those terms that they, are, they define the choices that Russian contemporary situation has to be made in some sense. They are empirically observable. We can argue that they are empirically observable. If you, if you analyze one aspect of the antinomy, you cannot neglect the other. This is the core, the core argument. I'll, sk I'll skip some of the basic arguments, however significant they would be for me or for, for social sciences, but I'll come back to the major findings. First of all, there is this hydrocarbons as a blessing and a curse. It means that Russia is still living on hydrocarbons in a world which is trying to get rid of the hydrocarbons. And this means that Russia is facing a big choice how to make its living and during the next decade, for example, based on hydrocarbons on the other hand and getting rid of them on the other hand. And what we have witnessed in, in, uh, in our empirical analysis is that Russia is trying to do this. They are trying to do this, but in many ways at the same time. They try to raise the, uh, uh, the uh, level of, of uh, the quality level of their own hydrocarbon products and at the same time, they, they are also trying to diversify the other fields of industries and try to, for example, now there is a big, very big reindustrialization process concern, uh, concerning the whole industrial structure. It's bigger than anything that has happened after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And this reindustrialization uh, project is called Importosameshenie replacing the imports. And it is going on. We don't know how far it goes. But there is also, within that, there is a strong other tension, which is about the neoliberal between contradiction or, or antinomy between neoliberalism versus developmental state. Russia is still very neoliberal state. It, it, uh, its um, social policy is very based on very austerity kind of approaches. And there is lots of economic freedom in Russia. Whereas, 
most of the think tanks since the mid 2000, starting from 2005, about they started to talk about uh, need of the development of state, growing more important role of the state, and so forth. But still, this is a very big problem for Russian economic policy. How they can balance this? And they have very many programs which are contradicting each other and, and which cannot maybe maintained at the same time. But definitely they are trying. Democracy versus authoritarianism, this is what defines contemporary Russia in terms of political system. Russia is a competitive political system in some sense, but the political system is not, is not, it is not totalitarian, but it is definitely dominated by one party without, with, without fair elections, for example, without fair alternatives, without uh, oppositional forces and so forth. Rule of law versus informal networks is something which is very core of Russia. This could be discussed for days and days, but it is definitely one of the key modernization traps of Russia that the formal rules and the informal rules do not work together. Then it's also policy. People, all Russians seem to be wishing for, for some kind of a state-run social policy, universal benefits provided by the state, and the state tends to be very neoliberal, very kind of a poor man's United States. And this is, uh, this is also a very fundamental contradiction in the field of social policy. And one of the reasons why this uh, neoliberal policy is strong in Russia is that it's based on fiscal conservatism. Russia, the collapse of the Soviet Union was very much connected with the fact that the fiscal situation of the state collapsed completely. They didn't have any reserve uh, funds at the moment when the energy price went down in the 1980s. And this is something where the Russians really have learned of their own history. This is not something that they want to repeat, and that's why they want to keep. They rather take the, risk, uh, the, the, the danger that people are accusing them for raising their pension age or, or jeopardizing the social policy system. They want to have the fiscal situation stable, and this is what they are doing at the moment. The fiscal conservatism is very strong. The situation in terms of social classes is very complicated. In a way, what has happened in Russia was that when, when the Russian government, both Russian government and all the Western experts were expecting that the middle class would be growing and becoming more significant in 1990s, in fact, it declined and lost its position. The Soviet middle class lost its position. Whereas in 2000s, then it started to really to develop and has been developing. And the living conditions of the middle class and the differences between the middle class and the working class are almost similar as in the West. But there is no class basis in terms of attitudes or political, political uh, activism in, in the society at all, not even in trade union membership or other things. So the paradox is that in terms of class situation, in terms of living conditions, life chances, classes matter, but in terms of political organization, political process, they do not matter much. And the trade unions, for example, who are supposed to have some kind of a role in ruling of the country, are, have a minimal role because of the lack of the resources. Then, again, Russia is not a totalitarian society, it's not a closed society. But it definitely articulates at the moment a political project which is against kind of open global information flows and against also it has strong nationalistic, nationalistic emphasis. And I have been for years saying that the, uh, the whole of Russian political sphere is nationalistic. There is no difference between political forces in that respect taking into account also the opposition. So, 
There are many global processes which concern Russia, economic processes, technological processes, information flows, cultural mass production, uh, also consumption patterns, social policy programs, and so forth. But at the same time, Russia is trying to close the society. But the people are still moving across the borders, and the society is far from being closed. But this is a problem with which, at the moment, they are working with. And our understanding of Russian sphere of culture, in fact, is the, what we are witnessing and what we are witnessing in, in this book, especially by, by Svetlana Alexeyevich, is a phenomenon which sociologists call anomie, the too rapid normative change. There has been so rapid normative change that the major vices have become virtues, and this caused a huge normative uh, regulation problems in Russia in 1990s. And it was, this was the atmosphere in the 1990s, the major phenomenon. What happened in 2000s and after that especially was that this anomaly, this not, the, in a way, life without fear and hope, I would characterize the 1990s in Russia, was replaced by strong process of desecularization. The religion was coming back. And these are my, my slides, which are quite telling. Here you can see how rapidly the, the religious identity is growing in contemporary Russia. And there is no differences in terms of classes. The only difference which exists is in terms of gender. Women are more religious than men. And this is the second phase of Russian so-called cultural and ideological development, which starts already in the 1990s, but comes closer and stronger in, in uh, 2000. And then around this, after 2010, the Russian government starts to develop a strong conservative offensive, hegemonic kind of conservative offensive, which is not only religion, but it is also other forms of conservatism. And this conservatism is facing also the so-called European values, Western values, and so forth. So there are interdependencies between these antinomies. But the problem with this conservative turn is that we always have to ask, what are the counter tendencies and does this work out or not? And there are many counter tendencies against this conservatism. And there is lots of, for example, this religiosity is not concerning people's way of life. Very, people, very few people are fasting, very few people are, are really attending church and, and these kinds of things. It's more like an identity issue. And if, uh, if it happens, to intervene too strongly to people's everyday life, then it strike, the conservative strikes back as it did in Poland when the abortion laws were changing. This is a complicated anomical situation or antinomical situation in contemporary Russia. Then this military great powerness versus economic interdependence is very complicated antinomy with which Russia is working at the moment. Because there is strong interdependency between the European Union and Russia, not very much between the United States and Russia. So, but, and the sanctions are hitting Russian in institutional and financial prospects and in, in, in terms of its reindustrialization policy and to some extent also in energy sector. But at the moment, what Russia is doing is that it is flying with one wing, and that wing is China. And as we heard today, again, a thing which started immediately when the NATO enlargement started, the Shanghai Cooperation was established, and ever since, Russia and China has been coming closer to each other in terms of foreign policy, in terms of defense policy, and so forth. And in fact, what we are witnessing already in terms of the international system is kind of a 
two military blocs, Shanghai Cooperation on the other hand and NATO on the other hand, facing each other. We don't speak much about Shanghai Cooperation in Finland because Shanghai Cooperation declares that it's not a military alliance as NATO used to do before the, before the Ukrainian crisis. Uh, it's, it's not about Russia. Now it's again about Russia. It's about China more and more. And, and the China-Russia cooperation also means that the more uh, the, uh, the China-West relationship is jeopardized, the more uh, the Russia is, the, the closer to China Russia is moving. Russia is giving in in sphere of influence fight to, to China in Central Asia, for example. So, we are living in a world where these antinomies and choices are here to stay. This is our major argument. When I spoke about limitation is that we are only given some kind of a conceptual vocabulary and methodological instruments how to understand contemporary Russia, not explaining how these choices will happen. And this also means that if these kinds of antinomies are there, and there is always possibilities to have different answers. Russia can invest more in renewables in the future, for example, and that would change the hydrocarbons things, but not yet, and not in the short run. But there is always lots of choices, and since the choices are not necessary, and they are not, on the other hand, they are not impossible, it means that there is lots of unpredictability in this kind of a multifaceted system that the contemporary Russia is. And it also means that we cannot predict very far. Our abilities to predict in this kind of a sphere is, is complicated. And it also means that the social criticism cannot concern, in fact, we should not try to have this kind of a social criticism which totalizes totalizes everything, but rather to look at the decisions which are made, look at their unintended results and the effects that they have for ordinary people's lives. This is, this is what is the task for the social sciences in contemporary world. We have maybe established now a vocabulary. We have established a new paradigm in order to understand Russia, but and here is my favorite citation from Winston Churchill. This is not the end. This is not the even beginning, the end of the end, but this might be the end of the beginning. So, so we have the concepts and, and that's where we end today. Okay, thank you. <laughs>